want to uh, certainly acknowledge, though, uh, Paul and his team here for the work that they do in creating a community amongst us that's so welcoming and friendly. It's really uh, wonderful to, to be here and, and amongst uh, and a part of this community. What I want to do today is uh, really share a few lessons and uh, a few reflections, basically, about community and programs. I want to tell some stories about uh, people who have taught me, and I'll share a little bit about some of the programs that I've, I've been involved with. What I want to start with, though, is, uh, is a story. So this is my grandmother. Uh, she was uh, born in Lancashire in 1898, and she was a proud weaver. When she was 14, she got a job in the Queen Street Mill in Burnley. It was really the icon of progress at the time. And as you can see, it looks like a beautiful, calm kind of uh, exterior. But here, oops, I did it again. On the inside of the mill, it wasn't quite as calm. There were 1,500 looms clacking away. It was a time of massive progress, and uh, they had just invented the flying shuttle, which allowed, these are all primarily women working in here, and allowed them to work on pieces of cloth larger than their, their arms could do. But these flying shuttles were massively dangerous, too. They were. Uh, flying all over the place. There were many industrial accidents during that time. And my mother and my grandmother worked very, very hard uh, in the mills and, uh, and saw, knew the, uh, the dangers and the difficulties of the work, but she never lost her great pride and love of the work that she was doing. And she carried her weaving lessons over to our family. And one of her favorite sayings to me was, you know, Vicki, it's the threads. It's all of the tiny threads that bind us together. Hmm? There we go. So as I've come to discover, um, you know, through my professional life, really just how right she was about this point, about these tiny threads. And that's really, you know, in the, in the course of my, uh, my career in the past 30 years, it's really been a focus on weaving those threads and of weaving what I would call life-giving relationships. I've been involved in a number of organizations that have all focused on bringing people together in some way or another. Family Support Institute of British Columbia for families of people with disabilities, um, Plan Lifetime Advocacy Network, created to answer the question of families of people with disabilities saying, what will happen to my relative when I die? And most recently, with Ties Personal Networks, an online solution to uh, addressing isolation for anyone facing a life challenge, including health-related concerns and aging. And I'm going to talk to you more about these programs as I go on, but first off, I think I want to tell a story that begins to bring some of this point of relationships to life. I'm going to tell you the story of David, and David was one of the very first and early members of PLAN. And it was his mother, Garland, who came to see us. Garland was in her 80s, and she was very worried about David. He, a lone child, he was living in the basement of their home, and David, was, he really did not have a person in the world to call a friend. His life consisted of uh, taking buses, he loved transportation, and uh, he was the expert on any hospital cafeteria in the city of Vancouver. And so that was where he took most of his meals. And Garland said, what, I don't know what's going to happen to David when I'm not here. 
When I first met David, I went over to Garland and David's home. Uh, she called David up from the basement, and uh, he came into the room, and he, uh, he said hello, and then he had invited me to get down on my knees and pray with him for a COPE victory in the next civic election. COPE is the very far left of party in Vancouver civic politics, and David was a passionate, passionate, uh, political activist in his way. He was, uh, what we did at PLAN was really take some time to get to know David. And aside from his passion for politics and his deep connection to Amnesty International, we can see him there in front of a, a, a typewriter. He was a massive letter writer for Amnesty International. And believe me, when he got a word processor, we thought maybe he brought down Suharto independently. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, aside from his political interests, he was a deeply religious man. His family was Jewish, but he was active in the Baptist church, and he had many connections like that. And thirdly, he was a passionate and deeply knowledgeable person about classical music. And what we did at PLAN with a community connector, so someone whose job it was was to really begin to weave those relationships, was built a network of care around David. And that network, that personal network, saw David through the loss of his mother. And I, I believe she died with peace of mind, knowing that David had friends in his life who cared about him. They helped him move into uh, an apartment. The family house had to be sold and so on. They really saw David through thick and thin. They were the ones who noticed when his hearing was going. Uh, they were the ones who, at, in the middle of the night, came and opened the door when he lost his keys and many, many other things. And they were the ones also who noticed that he, his balance was off. And there were some more troubling signs that eventually revealed that David had a brain tumor. And I was privileged to be watching all of the network unfold, but it was during the last part of David's life that I saw how a network of caring relationships truly, truly uh, can contribute to both a good life and indeed a good death in David's case. The caring that went on in terms of ensuring he was a part of any decision that was made in terms of his health was unbelievable. Um, the, the thoughtfulness about every piece of, of decision making that had to be made. The engagement of his network that included amongst other people Bramwell Tovey, who's in, he's in the center bottom picture there, he's the conductor of the Vancouver Symphony keeping everybody informed. Two days before David died, they actually, his network actually got him out to vote in the, in the federal election. So I would say David died a citizen. He passed in the company of his friends. And then the pictures that you see at the bottom are Peter Mansbridge from CBC's National News Bramwell Tovey, and then there's a picture of the audience at the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. And on this particular night, and the National reported on David, and they reported on this evening at the Vancouver Symphony, in which Bramwell Tovey talked to this elite and well-primed crowd and said, Yo, you may have noticed this slightly disheveled and unusual man who was my friend and who every single performance was backstage talking to me about the symphony, about uh, what, what he had appreciated. And sadly, he, he passed away, but tonight we're dedicating, it's Mozart's birthday, and we're dedicating Mozart's symphony to him. So, so those, this, you know, David, David's story is the whole package in a certain way of what it is that caring relationships have to teach all of us and how deeply critical uh, they are to, I believe, ultimately, even our human survival. As I began to study networks, I really began to understand that absolutely nothing 
happens in isolation. Networks, these caring networks, these webs, these interconnected threads are really complex living adaptive systems. There's never one that's the same. They don't follow a typical uh, predictable trajectory. There are ebbs and flows in, in how they go. But no matter about how complex they are, uh, what is really key or very clear is that caring relationships are absolutely fundamental to all that is healthy. And in some ways on the surface that seems really obvious, it's probably no surprise here, everybody would agree, but you know, you, you need to know as well that there's just a massive body of research and evidence now underneath this. Um, and, and this particular phrase, that a faithful friend is the medicine of life, which is a proverb from centuries ago, is uh, absolutely true. We know that we live longer when we have caring relationships, that we get sick less often, that we heal more quickly, that indeed we even, we're, no, we're readmitted to hospital less often, all of those kinds of things. But we also know, even beyond health, that caring relationships are about employment outcomes, academic outcomes, about our safety, they're about problem-solving capacity, they're about our personal agency in the world, they're about our resilience, they're about what give us presence in this world. They also do something else. Living ties grow our spirits tell you about Christabel. Christabel is a young woman who was involved in another of our programs called Ties Personal Networks, which is an online program to help create these same networks like David had, but using an online environment. And I'll tell you a few more details about Ties later, but I want to tell you about Christabel specifically here because she was caring for her mother who had metastatic breast cancer. And um, she uh, it was working when, uh, when the cancer came back. Uh, she was able to keep her job for some time. And then eventually, because her mother's care needs grew, uh, she needed to leave, leave her, her job. She and her brother and a network of people certainly uh, supported her mother and, and also helped her to have the end of her, her life in a very peaceful way. But what I want to tell you about Christabel, what she said about this experience of being a caregiver is she said, I have the right to be a caregiver. And why that's for me such a powerful phrase is it flips it on its head. It's not a burden. It's a gift. It's a, it's a piece of life that's very critical. Uh, to growing our spiritual capacity, our, um, our connection to things that are larger than ourselves, these life passages that help us to grow and become who we're destined to be. So when you think about you know, health, employment, you know, all the things that are, that are helped by relationships along with just our spiritual development, it's really time. Uh, for us to have what, what I would call uh, a revolution of belonging or a revolution of caring. And again, you'd think it'd be kind of slam dunk. Of course we should be doing it. But for, there's a few things that are getting in our way, even with this unbelievable crisis of belonging that's happening today. It's a 21st century problem. We're so hyper-connected, beyond time, space, all the boundaries that might, we think we can connect instantaneously, yet more and more people are living alone than ever. 25% of Canadian seniors live on their own, as an example. Uh, more people are spending more hours watching TV. People are reporting feeling alienated. I mean, the, the stats and the lists go on. And so you say, well, why is that in this time of all the opportunities for interconnection? Uh, we know that isolation underpins our most intractable social problems. 
Um, but what, what, what's getting in the way? And I want to point out a couple of things that I think are really getting in the way. And one is this. It's our myth of independence. And, um, you know, I'm somebody who's been a part of the independent living movement in, in many ways, and I understand where it came from, but it's a myth. None of us has a good life living sole and independent. Uh, and, and why is, you know, why is this myth taken on what I think quite massive proportions? And I think it's our collective fear of dependency. And it's a denial of our dependencies. And I, I put all of us together in this. So there is such a high value placed on independence. But I would say my, one of my most significant lessons in our work related to, uh, to networks and so on, is that there is no independence without interdependence, right? No independence without interdependence. This is another way of saying that. Independence is knowing who you can depend on. Another dynamic that's really underpinning this crisis of belonging and that gets in our way of uh, addressing it is what I would call uh, giving and receiving. Life-giving relationships always involve both giving and receiving. They were what, they're what my grandmother would call the warp and the weft of the weaving, giving and receiving. And why is this, you know, it seems obvious. Why is this, uh, is, uh, is this a challenge? Well, first off, I'm just going to show you what I, I love this picture, and I just always have to keep including it, because these are people engaged <laughs> in relationship and engaged in giving and engaged in receiving from one another. So why is it so hard, and this is particularly for those of us who are in roles of creating community and so on, I want to speak very personally to, it's about this, all right? <laughs> okay. Right. very hard for us to ask. Right? And, um, you know, asking is about making ourselves vulnerable. Our nonverbal language is about with the open palm. That's a cross-cultural symbol for vulnerability. And um, underpinning this, um, uh, the, uh, the asking, is, of course, always a fear of, of refusal. So asking and then the other dynamic of asking, and that needs to happen with it, is the receiving. And what's difficult about receiving? Well, when you are in a role as a helper of some kind, you are in a role of being perpetually competent, always having the answers, knowing, knowing what to do. I had my own experience, a very uh, significant experience uh, personally when uh, about a decade ago I had breast cancer. And the lesson that came out of that for me as I, I mean, it, was, it felt like a wall even had to crumble to begin to receive the gifts that, that were coming at me and all the love that came my way. But what I realized in that receiving was how I had been actually keeping all kinds of people at bay from me, including the people that I was helping and creating networks for and so on. I was all the doing, all the giving, and not receiving from them, not receiving their gifts back to me. So what I want to do is, um, is just take a pause here right now, and I'm going to do this a couple of times, is just create some opportunities for you to talk to one another. And what I'd like to invite you to do is just 
take a moment, turn to the person next to you, and simply share the last time you asked somebody for help. And so just, just take a moment, this is the last time you asked, and then anything you want to say about it. What did it feel like? Whatever. Okay? So just find a person the last time you asked someone for help. Anybody want to share anything from that? Anybody got a thought? Was it easy? Is that uh, perpetual competence something that anybody's experienced? Yeah. Okay. For, yes. I think we, we said that sometimes asking for help makes us feel weak or we think people will think we're weak. That asking for help makes us feel weak or, or that people will see us as weak, right? Or dependent, right? This fear of dependency. Yeah. Ross? For me, it's around the fear of being rejected or denied the, the support. It's better not to ask to do it yourself than to ask and, uh, and, and then have the other that I've asked uh, um, say no or say, that's not my problem yeah. or... You know, and yeah. so I, it's it's easier for me to just do it myself. I don't think it's helpful, but yeah, it's a fear. Yeah, so it's easier to do it ourselves, and and just not have that fear of of, uh, of rejection. That's actually one of the beauties of a, of a group or a network is when there is an intentionally formed one, people are much more free to say yes or no because there's not just one person being relied on. Sometimes that makes a big difference. We came up with an idea really fast. Uh, we just asked this morning at 7 a.m. when I asked for help, and on the weekend Kelly asked, and it was about technology. So we have no problem blaming our age and asking for help when it comes to technology to our children or our younger staff. However, as a woman, when it comes to asking for help, I care give for my mother to come here for three days. Boy, was it ever uh, hard to ask my siblings to step up for a couple of days and help out because we then feel we can't do it ourselves. So it made me reflect how come some things are easy, but when it comes to more personal things or feeling that we can't do it because we should be able to do everything by ourselves, yeah. that it's harder to ask for help. I find tasks very easy to ask for help with. Um, I talk to people for, for a living. My house, I need to rely on my friends and my, uh, my acquaintances to be able to come and, and offer me that assistance because if I did it, it would look like I did it and that isn't very pretty. <laughs> the other thing is that we derive such pleasure and such joy and such fulfillment out of helping others. And I think when we do not allow others to help us, we are denying them that which we find the greatest value and the greatest self-worth from. So I think we need to open ourselves to being able to ask for tasks and emotional and you know, whatever kind of support and help we need because that then is, is still giving to other people. I guess with age, it's gotten easier to ask for help. Um, in my, before I was retired in a big organization, I worked in a leadership position. It was difficult to put yourself out there to ask for help because you'd always fear being incompetent you know, being looked at as incompetent or something. So now that I don't have a position, I don't have an office, uh, if I need something, it's gotten a lot easier to make a call or do an email and saying, if you want, I want to do this, but there's no way in the world I'm going to be able to do it unless I get some help. And I'm amazed at the help I get. And even in other times, even asking for help in the community about other, about other things, sometimes, I don't know, I still get that about asking. But once you get over that fear, it's amazing how good it gets to get some help. Because you can't solve all the problems in the world. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. Good. I think another reason uh, we don't like to ask for help is because when most of the people that I know seem to be having special problems, other people I know say, she needs professional help. Yeah. And I think that uh, we live in a consumer culture where it may not be so much we're afraid to ask for help, but that 
we know we could buy it. I just wanted to say thanks to the folks uh, in our conversation because we had a really good cry and some laughs together. Um, and it reminded me of um, Brené Brown's work around vulnerability mm -hmm. and how she talks about you can't selectively numb emotions. So if we numb vulnerability, we numb joy, we numb gratitude. And uh, I'm, I'm just really thankful for uh, the chat I got to have with these lovely people. One of the quotes that has been, and one of the thinkers around this is a woman named Bonnie Cher Klein who wrote a book. She experienced a stroke. Uh, she was a National Film Board filmmaker, Academy Award nominee, and she experienced a stroke and definitely became a person now who's living with a disability. And what she says is that what she's discovered is that when she asks other people for help, is that she's offering them an opportunity to be their most human, right? It's a beautiful way of thinking about it. I want us to switch gears a little bit now, and um, so we've been thinking about some of the, you know, isolation. It's it, we are we have this 21st century challenge, although we know even though we know the incredible powerful things that belonging and connection can do that nothing else can provide. Um, and so how do we begin to address it? And it's by getting intentional, and that's a bit about what I want to talk about. And when I'm talking about this getting intentional, I'm going to use some program examples, but I want you to know that I think we all need to be intentional ourselves about our own networks as well. That this isn't just some special something for special people who've been identified as, as vulnerable to isolation. I can promise you, everybody in this room, you will come into circumstances in your lifetime where you will be vulnerable to isolation because of health challenges, life challenges, moving all, so many, many things. So having a group of people that you know that are connected to one another is a very powerful way to be resilient, to bounce back from vulnerability, and so on. So getting intentional, let's just talk a little bit about that. Uh, when we get intentional, what we get is what I call the network effect. And in part, that's what I was referring to when I said you have the effect of uh, that when you ask, you ask more than one person often, and that makes it very easy for people to freely give to you without feeling uh, you know, the, ob the obligation. Here's some of the things that the network effect creates. When, when a network, a small personal network of committed people are connected, is it, you know, certainly, um, you know, everybody benefits, it mobilizes beneficiaries, but it, it mobilizes supports, it literally get, get, provides informational, instrumental, and emotional support, and it strengthens uh, the connections amongst the group, and all of those together really equal resilience. Some of the design principles under these ideas of intentional networks include things like inspiration and engagement, working through shared interests and attitudes, ease of participation, that it's simple, it's just simple. And so somebody talked about tasks. I mean, the more specific and clear we can be about often our asks, the easier it is for people to, uh, to contribute. But there's a focus on sharing. That really, it's back to this giving and receiving. It's really what, and, and it's not, uh, while a network is formed around a person, there is an exchange, and it's about shining a light on it. It's about creating spaces that are hospitable and supportive and also safe and private and trusting. So I want to share a few stories or examples from uh, our work at PLAN. And as I mentioned earlier, PLAN was created, it's 25 years old this year. We got to have that beautiful celebration last night, uh, recognizing that. And it was created by families saying, What's going to happen to my relative with a disability when I die? And today has, I think, well over 50 connectors uh, that are busy in the lower mainland area of Vancouver. But the, the method, the model of using community connectors is being used not just across Canada, but it's being used in um, really all over the world. PLAN offers a, an online course and training in how to do this. 
And a little bit later, uh, Tim Ames, the, uh, execu you know, the current executive director of Plan and I, when we do a workshop, we'll get into some of the real more nitty gritty of, of the idea of building networks and so on. So, so know that we'll get more specific. But what I want to focus on here is just some of these people and what they have to share. And that's what we've built the networks around. Uh, we've got uh, here in the middle of this lovely sailing boat are Cheryl and Jamie. And what they've had to share, they've got many things, but it is their beautiful marriage. They have an example of a partnership and of a marriage that inspires everyone around them. This is Michelle, and uh, that is a big happily stuffed snake around her neck. But what I want you to know is uh, that she would be just as happy if it was live. And she adores, I mean, really adores snakes and spiders. And the thing is, you think, well, I mean, like, for, and, and actually the first time I met Michelle, she had on her apartment door a big sign that said, keep out. And when you go inside of her apartment, there were all those uh, spidery things that they have at, uh, at Halloween. You know, so it really is this shrine to spiders and snakes. And I think the keep out was kind of her way of just, nobody's going to hurt me anymore, right? But what we discovered that, you know, she's not the only person who loves snakes. I bet there's people here who love them, not me. But there are. <laughs> and uh, in fact, there's a wildlife reptile refuge in, uh, in Surrey, in British Columbia, where that's all they do is rescue. People amazingly give snakes for Christmas gifts and things like that. Uh, then surprisingly, some people don't want them. <laughs> and they end up in the refuge. And people like Michelle go and really take care of them. And so these interests and helps to connect to others. This is Wendy. She is a lover of animals and, and has a deep capacity with them in a way uh, that creates awe in others, and she shares that. And this is Robert, who is uh, a lover of steam engines and trains. And it's sort of a funny story, because in, in British Columbia, we have the Hudson the, uh, the Royal Hudson. Has anybody ever ridden on that? Goes from Vancouver up to Squamish. It's a, yeah, it's an awesome trip up there. It's really beautiful. And a lot of volunteers take care of this train. That's what they do. They really make sure that it is in, in tip-top shape to, uh, to go up and down the coast of, of British Columbia. The thing that's interesting about this is that the connector who was working with Robert and introduced him to these other, these men, who t it's all men, who take care of the train. And she was just there sort of at their first gathering. And she said, you know, when I, um, I have to tell you this, when I met Robert and he was talking incessantly about trains and he just wouldn't stop, it was just always trains, trains, trains. She said, and I, and I thought it was like part of his disability, but it's not, they all do it. Right? So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is Ed at the center of, uh, of this network. And, you know, Ed is that, if you can see that joyous smile there, and he, that's what he shares. And it's such, he's such a unique and special character. He's like a, some ways like a, like a leprechaun of joy. He's also somebody who has probably the highest stack of files describing him for all of his behavioral challenges and all the gazillions of other things about him. But when he shares that, he, and he, you know, interesting, when we did his very first network, you know, there were 20 people showed up to that very first meeting and you think, well, why? You know, why do we even need to formalize this in any way? But the truth was nobody had uh, known him for longer than a, than a few months because he's somebody who can cycle through people who phones incessantly and so on. But what the network has done is that they've, he's had people in his life now for 20 years walking with him, who know him, who love him, and love him for all of him, for who he is. So those are some of the planned stories. And let me now just switch gears a little bit to... Um, to talk about, about ties. 
And, um, you know, why, why did we create ties? So ties, you know, we took essentially the lessons of a lot of what we had been learning at PLAN. And we began to understand that this question of isolation wasn't just about people with disabilities. We're all vulnerable to it, but especially people who are aging, people facing life challenges, and so on. So how do we get this out into the water supply? How do we get this knowledge about networks out there? And in particular, we began to focus on how do we get uh, this knowledge into healthcare? Is there anybody here that works in healthcare? Okay. Well, in my experience, health, you know, um, the whole sort of community service, social service, municipal landscape is, is very entrenched. Healthcare is like a vault. <laughs> It is a very, very difficult system to, uh, to penetrate. And uh, it became a really interesting exercise to try to take the technology of TIES, which is an online service that helps people have networks of support that coordinate care. Just as a very, very quick peek here, I mean, how TIES work, it's like a personal private Facebook, share stories and so on. It also uh, has a calendar, it has tasks, it has um, various uh, technology things that actually help to bridge into the formal system. So today, um, home care workers, for example, their schedule can be popped right into this calendar. So there's ways that it's actually bridging into the formal system. And this became, this is a very important concept, these bridges and pathways. Because what, how we began to frame what we were doing in healthcare had to start to use different language and talking about what we were doing. Um, and we started to talk about moving from an individual model to a network model of care. So that became what, you know, how we began to, uh, to present ties. And um, this, by the way, is, um, is really the land of, you know, when I think about Sherry's work in her presentation yesterday, uh, this is the realm of policy that is so, so critical. So that individual model into a network model that includes community. You know, community provides 80% of our care, but you would never know it, the way that the resources flow, the way that who's in control of the decisions, and so on and so forth. But the profound knowledge of our care needs, and especially today when people are living with chronic and complex diseases, they're living longer, all those kinds of things, it, it's nothing to do with actually the formal systems of care that, um, or very minimal to do with the formal systems of care um, in, in ensuring a quality of life and so on. This, um, this whole thing, uh, you know, here's, uh, here's another picture that begins to, you know, illustrate this idea of a network and of family and friends bridging and pathways. And the technology actually be, is quite a beautiful thing to create bridges but not try to mix them up, which is what I would say is one of the great sort of pitfalls that one can get into in thinking about these networks of care or personal networks is trying to meld two systems. It's not about integrating care at all. It's just actually about trying to cre create pathways for information to be flowing both ways. In any case, I learned a lot of new language uh, in, uh, in healthcare and in technology, and, and it kind of makes me think of, um, I don't know if you've ever heard about this, uh, this story about uh, a mother mouse. And, and uh, she, was, uh, she was walking down a country lane one day with her little mouselings. And they were having a lovely summer's romp when this big cat comes out of the fields. And it's got its back arched and it hisses. And the mother mouse just calmly gathers her little ones all close to her, looks up at the cat right in the eye and goes, woof, woof, woof. The cat turns, runs off, and the mother mouse looks down at her little mouselings and says, now children, let that be a lesson to you. Never underestimate the power of a second language. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, this is a little more, I think, of some of that second language, care staff, scheduling back ends, all that kind of thing. But what I, why I included this slide was to tell you that I'm really very, very pleased to let you know that TIES has now um, been adopted. It's been acquired by St. Elizabeth Healthcare. It is now a part of the healthcare system in some ways. And St. Elizabeth is using it for people that it serves. It's a very large home healthcare organization here in Canada. It's a national organization. And it's also taking this model out in, uh, into the US. So we'll see. So let's, uh, let's uh, in a way of, uh, we're almost at, uh, at the end here, but there's a couple of other things to, uh, to just share with you. And, you know, when, you know, the question is about this point of getting intentional, I just wanted to touch on who benefits. When we get intentional, when we actually think about creating these networks for ourselves, for others, who benefits is the people that are in the network, of course. Anybody who's actually providing service will benefit. And of course, we all benefit. And it's people like Maggie here. She actually uh, and her dad were TIES users. That's how they kept the extended family and everybody informed. Ted and Josh. Uh, Ted is here. He's the current president of, uh, of PLAN. And um, Josh is a little bit older than this today, and he actually is actually quite a bit older than this uh, beautiful picture. And he now lives with the family. And that family, and Ted, and Kathy, and their extended family connect on ties all the time updating each other, uh, what's going on, and the beautiful uh, daily events of Josh's life are shared there. And people like Nancy, who she's somebody who came in with a gusto and created her own ties network. She was somebody who had uh, uh, another person actually who had metastatic breast cancer, and uh, she was always a, a, a powerhouse. She actually was a Canadian icon in the mental health field. And she organized her network. I'm not kidding you. She had 30 people on there, and they were all doing stuff within, I don't know, maybe an hour. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Her rides to the pool, her medication, all that stuff. But you know, uh, over time, uh, she became less able to do that. And it was her children, and in particular, her 24-year-old son who became her primary caregiver. And one of the things that happened, I mean, he, he videotaped her medication regime, for example, for other people, so everybody could tell you know, what the meds would be, and there was many practical uses. But one of the most profound things that he did is he at one point wrote to the whole network, and he said, Mom and I really want to thank you for all the help that you've given us. And, um, but I, I have to ask you for one more thing. And he said, you know, ever since I've known my mom, she's been such a doer. And I want you to help me to help her to slow down. Right? So beautiful stories about how people can use networks. So where I want to just in summary take you now is on a, a little bit of a final reflection. And I think I'll just start here to show you uh, this incredible, incredible piece of fabric art. And it's such, it was such a fit in with the beginning of my grandmother and the weaving and everything. And, and we received this gift last night. It's made by uh, Lynn Vincent Haven, who lives, who, sorry, Thompson Haven, sorry. And um, uh, so Lynn Thompson Haven, who is a resident here of this, of this community. And this is a gorgeous, gorgeous piece of fabric or pieces of fabric uh, put together showing that everyone belongs. And so in speaking to that, what I want to say in summary is that my learnings are that isolation underpins our most intractable social challenges. 
Uh, two, that the myth of independence furthers that isolation. Number three, that life-giving relationships are about giving and receiving. And number four, that we all need to be intentional about our networks. Um, caring relationships are fundamental to life. Fundamental to life. Creating opportunities to care and be cared for by any means possible grows increasingly important in these times of environmental degradation and growing social injustice. Our human ecology is quite simply inseparable from the ecology of the world. Every day, each of us has a myriad of opportunities to strengthen the fabric of our lives, our communities, our families. It's time to ramp up our revolution of belonging. Thanks very much. <laughs>